Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm very glad everyone could be here today. Um, this is the first in our three-part discussion series, Researching the Pandemic, Critical Conversations. From the very start of COVID-19 pandemic, researchers and scholars of all kinds hit the ground running to investigate the impacts of the situation from their perspective, um, from their disciplines. At the same time, though less noticed, the pandemic has had wide ranging effects on the work of research itself and on the mechanisms of scholarly communication through which new knowledge is transmitted. My colleagues and I, like many across campus, have been inspired by the Perspectives on the Pandemic lecture series offered by Fairmount College, both this semester and last spring. In our conversations about it, we talked about how the perspective of faculty librarians is somewhat different and complementary to that of departmental faculty. Librarians, by the nature of our work at the Center of Intellectual Inquiry on campus, have a unique opportunity to regularly interact with research endeavors from a wide range of academic disciplines and act as stewards of the multidisciplinary resources necessary to tackle complex problems, such as public health crises. As such, these talks offer something of a behind the scenes look into this unique period of research and how it's been approached, and some of the challenges and opportunities that have arisen from researching both about and during a global pandemic. In the next two discussions in our series, we will be joined by departmental faculty from across campus for insights into two major themes of research surrounding COVID-19, media influence and social inequality. In today's talk, I'm joined, with some, joined by some of my colleagues from University Libraries Research and Instructional Services Unit to share our unique perspective as subject expert librarians from different academic departments on how the pandemic has affected scholarly communication. Moderating the discussion for us today is our Associate Dean for Academic Engagement and Public Services, Ginger Williams. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ginger Williams. I'm responsible for the leadership of library operations that directly serve students, faculty, and staff at Wichita State, as well as our community members. My primary research interest is in informational, um, informal membership, mentorship practices as they relate to academic librarianship. Megan Kuhlman is instruction and research services librarian and assistant professor. Her subject areas are the School of Business, English Language and Literature, Public Administration and Social Work, and her research interests are critical information, literacy, instruction, and pedagogy, and library services for first-generation college students. Nathan Filbert is Instruction and Research Services Librarian and Assistant Professor. He's the liaison for the Sciences and Philosophy and the Cohen Honors College. His research interests include digital literacy and digital culture, theories of computation and philosophy of technology, semiotics of multimodal learning and human computer interaction, and information literacies, pedagogies, and information access governance. Aaron Bowen is instruction and research services librarian and assistant professor for the health sciences, communication, and psychology. His research interests include evidence-based practice in health education and healthcare settings, graphic and intellectual design and layout of library web pages as a means of presenting information to students, and usability testing of library websites. Maria Sclafani is coordinator of library instruction and assistant professor. Her subject areas lie within the College of Applied Studies. Her research interests include library instruction and pedagogy and the information needs of and library services for incarcerated populations. Our last panelist is Ethan Lindsay, humanities and social sciences librarian and assistant professor. His subject areas include history, sociology, criminal justice, political science and religion, and research interests include digital humanities and the history of libraries with a focus on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. For today's panel, I'm going to pose a series of questions to my colleagues, many of which will be addressed by multiple panelists. We will have set aside time at the end of today's session to take questions if any of you have them. To begin with, I'd like to ask my colleagues, how traditional processes of research and publication have been disrupted 
in your various subject fields. Yeah, um, so I'm happy to go first. Um, so um, in terms of changes um, for the College of Applied Studies disciplines, um, a lot of research in these areas involves human subjects. Um, and, you know, there have been a lot of research projects that have been modified, suspended, or terminated during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and in terms of um, IRB, so Institutional Review Board policies, there have been some changes. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office for Human Research Protections <laughs> uh, issued guidance um, on how to make modifications to existing research studies um, in order to protect patient privacy and consider other issues. Um, in terms of sports management, for example, you know, sports have been heavily impacted by the pandemic, but we don't yet know what the outcome of that will be um, for sports management. Um, so that's a bit of a challenge. To some extent, you know, the, the peer reviewed literature has, has not addressed it yet because there hasn't been enough time um, in terms of education and higher ed, um, so the pandemic has really um, highlighted and potentially exacerbated a lot of pre-existing issues in education in the United States. Um, and although those issues are important, um, absolutely, and need to be addressed in the scholarship, um, there's a gap between the research that practitioners need to do their jobs in education and what is available for them. So, you know, people who are involved heavily in education do not have necessarily the time to publish about what they're doing. And so, you know, a lot of um, long standing practices, um, if a school was face to face and it has been face to face forever, you know, that has changed. And so there just is this gap where the research is needed, but it's not really possible to produce it. Um, and so a lot of, of educators are sort of, um, they, f they feel that they're on their own or that they're figuring things out for the first time. Um, and there has been some, you know, calls or questions about do we want to potentially, you know, in terms of what has actually been published in this field, there are, you know, questions about do we want to potentially rethink education on a large scale right now instead of implementing short term changes and assuming that when this is over, we can go back to the way it was before. So that's some of the ongoing discussion is, you know, what large changes might we need to make to education permanently um, after this. Thank you, Maria. Um, yeah, so the question is, um, how have processes of research and publication been disrupted? Um, and in my subject fields, I work with uh, quite a number of, of somewhat disparate subject fields, um, but thinking of social work, public administration, and even marketing um, from a resource perspective, there is a, quite a lot of overlap in the materials and the resources that are used. And in particular, those fields are really heavy in the use of demographic data and social data information, um, that sort of thing. And so there have been some challenges um, since the pandemic in just gathering accurate information um, in a lot of different areas, but a couple examples of that that have really struck me. Um, one in particular is the decennial census, which hopefully everyone on this call has already filled out, um, almost done. But that comes, of course, of course, once every 10 years. So it's very important that we get accurate data because we don't have another chance to do that type of work um, for another, another decade. And of course that happened right at the start of the pandemic was when that information gathering began. So this was uh, the first year where they were doing a really large push to collect that data electronically, which is really excellent for um, you know, the pandemic situation. However, there is still a huge need for people to actually go out and knock on doors and go to communities and talk with people personally, especially in low income neighborhoods in linguistically isolated communities on tribal lands, those sorts of things. Um, so most states are reporting at least 90% of households have um, at this point have responded to the census. In Kansas, it's 91% as of last week. However, there are certain communities and typically low-income communities where that number is in the 40 to 50% still. 
Um, so originally the census collection was going to end in July. And then because of the pandemic that was extended until the end of October. However, there were some political issues and they had decided to end that um, in early September, so a, week, a month less, um, and there was a lot of panic in that. Um, and just, I think four or five days ago, there was a court order that they are going to now extend that into the end of October. So it's been sort of a nail biting summer of how is the census going to be able to collect that accurate data. Um, and a somewhat kind of related issue that's come up recently, not the census, but with the CDC, um, they had uh, what they're calling the CASPER program, Community Assessment for Public Health Emergency Response. And this was a program for select states to go door to door again and collect data on um, how the pandemic has affected communities that might be best reached by um, someone actually going to their door. So in those states, the CDC workers in well-marked vehicles were going door to door, but in the state of Minnesota, um, they actually had to end that collection because of a somewhat unprecedented situation of um, racial slurs to a lot of the CDC workers and racial aggression, which from what I'm reading that is, is really unusual. So, um, you know, that's sort of a related thing. It's just another issue that's been going on across the country this summer that has impacted our ability to collect accurate data on what's going on. And so for, of course, our research now, but even the research in 10 or 20 years in the future, will be strongly impacted if we don't have accurate data to draw from. So that has been something that's been on my radar for my subject areas this summer. Thank you, Megan. Um, I um, work with several departments on campus. So um, one, one, of the, one of the departments is history. Um, and I, I will probably uh, right now talk mainly about uh, the challenges that, that uh, researchers in that area face. Um, with social sciences. Um, so hi history, people, um, professors and, and graduate students um, in this area, one of, one of the big challenges um, really was just the, um, the closed library. So, you know, obviously um, getting into March, um, um, April, um, many libraries and archives uh, had, to, had to close to, to the public entirely. Uh, and, it's, and it's a really big challenge uh, for historians as well. And part of that is um, so much of the research um, is based on um, uh, print materials, uh, items that are only in print. Um, and and one, of the, one of the major ways, probably the major way of publishing in history um, is, is the scholarly monograph. So um, an academic book uh, that is written by by a single scholar is is the main way that historians publish. Those are the expectations uh, for university professors um, in in that area for for tenure uh, and, and so forth. So um, so just you know not having access to to print collections to the to the physical libraries to the archives, you know was was a major problem. Um, you know of course now uh, many many archives. Um, um, are, are having more, more and more digital collections, more and more uh, digitized uh, materials uh, that, that, you know, of course are accessible, whether the, the physical, whether a person can actually enter the physical building or not. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a major development. It's a really good thing uh, just in terms of access. Um, another, another good thing is just uh, the, the e-books, which we, you know, we here are, are purchasing more and more uh, e-books um, partly uh, because of the the, uh, the circumstances that we're in now. So so ebooks uh, again are, are a very good thing um, for uh, for access uh, for for you know getting getting these uh, these books without having to actually visit the physical places, the physical libraries. Uh, but they they have challenges as well. So uh, they they tend to be uh, quite a bit more expensive. Uh, which can be a challenge uh, for, for all types of libraries, public and university libraries. Um, th there are um, very complicated licensing issues with these. Uh, we normally um, buy these um, for just one uh, synchronous user at a time. Only one person can use the ebook at a time. Um, and there, this also relates to all just all the issues with um, um, using technology uh, for, for accessing any, any you know, library material. So obviously a person will, will have to have uh, uh, 
a tablet or a, or a computer uh, ju just to read uh, just to read these materials. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Ethan. Uh, the changes that have taken place in the the literature published in the health sciences are. Um, immense to the point that it's almost impossible to know where to begin. Uh, there are all kinds of things I could talk about, but instead I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, just a, a pair of uh, major journals in the field of health sciences um, and uh, a, a, another question that has uh, cropped up within uh, the field as well. Uh, the two journals are the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, uh, and also um, Morbidity and Morb Mortality uh, Weekly Report, uh, which is published by the CDC. Uh, recently, uh, three JAMA editors uh, together, the third of which uh, is Howard Bachner, the chief editor of all of JAMA. Uh, recently, the, these three editors um, came together to, to introduce a, an issue of JAMA with an editorial talking about um, the editorial independence of research uh, about the coronavirus conducted in the coronavirus era, in the pandemic era. Uh, and in this uh, editorial, they affirm the uh, process of peer review uh, for the articles that they publish uh, in their journal and the, the level of authority they, they believe that um, that process ascribes to the material they publish. Uh, and they also outline uh, three other uh, critical trends uh, that they see happening uh, in the uh, health sciences publishing world. Uh, one in particular, um, as they themselves write, uh, the public's health is threatened by sophisticated campaigns churning disinformation into social media and other platforms as part of what the World Health Organization is calling an infodemic. Uh, as a matter of health and potentially national security, health agencies, public health authorities, elected leaders, news organizations, and editors and publishers all need to find strategies to counter disinformation. The health of the global population depends upon this effort. Uh, so they're uh, concerned about the level of noise and the the the, the level of uh, misinformation, you know, questionable information that may have been made uh, public through human error and also disinformation, uh, non-credible information made public intentionally as a uh, an effort to to cloud uh, what is known about the pandemic. Uh, they're, they're very concerned about uh, this issue, and they want um, JAMA as the journal that they, that they, uh, uh, that they edit uh, to serve as a, um, a, a compendium of record uh, and a, a model of factual information uh, for many reasons, but one of the chief ones is to combat the misinformation and disinformation they see emerging. Uh, during uh, 2020. Uh, they also write that the pandemic has exposed vulnerabilities in public and private health uh, systems uh, with costs to uh, health and lives borne by the least fortunate. Uh, they want uh, to, uh, in discussing the pandemic, they want to highlight uh, health inequities uh, and make sure that uh, health information is available to all people wherever uh, it is needed and wherever it uh, can be of value uh, for anywhere from uh, health workers and public health uh, scientists to uh, the uh, average general public uh, looking for information about uh, the pandemic. Uh, third, they write, uh, the national U.S. pandemic response has been halting and fragmented, just as airport security has not and never would be ceded to individual states. Uh, health security for the country cannot come from states acting alone without coordination to manage regional infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, so they, they call for uh, comprehensive uh, federal leadership uh, in the face of the pandemic um, and 
do uh, want to avoid the fragmented approach that we've had so far. Uh, so those are the three uh, areas that they see affecting how we talk about research uh, in the health sciences uh, relating to the pandemic that are in need of some level of correction. Uh, there were a couple of reports recently. Uh, there, it's not completely uh, known that uh, what the reports are discussing took place or did not take place, but there, there are reports of uh, federal administration officials uh, interfering with the publishing process of uh, morbidity and mortality weekly review, uh, altering the, the information that this CDC publication uh, presents. Uh, so uh, it, it's not clear what happened, but uh, some editors, uh, so, some former editors of MMWR uh, got together to uh, write that uh, this should not happen, uh, that editorial independence uh, of this publication is paramount, and the publication has always had, as a, a, part, a big part of its charge, to follow where uh, scientific inquiry and scientific data lead and uh, publish that uh, accordingly. Uh, so these former editors of this journal are dismayed uh, that about even the allegation that uh, any, any uh, agency within the federal government would seek to interfere with that process. And they're right, that does um, uh, cause a question of trust uh, to arise in this publication where there shouldn't be one. Uh, an editorial independence should be guaranteed so that the journal can indeed publish scientifically sound information. Uh, there is, uh, similar questions have um, revolved around, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the process of uh, engaging in randomized controlled trials to uh, su search for a, um, a treatment uh, for the coronavirus. Uh, and there have been uh, considerable concerns voiced in uh, the health science literature about the politiza politization of that uh, process uh, and whether it's been uh, moved through too fast uh, to try and produce treatments and vaccines. Um, you know, that, that process has been forced along too fast for political reasons. Uh, and that's a big concern uh, that... Um, uh, voices in the health science literature have been uh, voicing uh, on behalf of uh, the uh, U.S. public who would then be in line to receive a vaccine when one is developed. If they can't trust uh, that this vaccine was developed with true and proper uh, safeguards to make sure it is both effective and doesn't have uh, se severely harmful side effects, then yeah, that's another trust issue uh, that uh, people in the, the health science uh, community have written about um, extensively. Thank you, Aaron. Um, yeah, so disruption is a great word, I think, for what has occurred to the processes of research, publication, and learning, I'm going to add for the parts I really notice in the, in the sciences and the humanities portions that I work with, um, just like in our own lives, I guess. But the primary things I notice in the, let's say, chemistry and biology areas are the disruption to laboratory work. This also applies to physics uh, very strongly in the departments I work with. So where access to international laboratories or even local laboratories has been greatly delimited. And even if there is access, a lot of the actual laboratory groups can't meet at the same time for questions of social distancing and so forth. And then in the learning piece of that, what I've really noticed is, uh, you know, trying to transition to virtual or online forms of that uh, there's some great software and programs out there to model and 
uh, practice what one might do in the lab, but the difference between the messiness of the materiality of a laboratory and the ways you can work a computer program, very discreet, are quite different for the student learning. And I know that, you know, in many, in many aspects of the sciences, we've used computer modeling for prediction and so forth before we test it in the lab, but turning learning primarily towards that in many of these cases um, has really affected the learning process as I see it and the un comprehension or understanding of what it would be like to be doing it with liquids and <laughs> enzymes and temperatures and all the fluctuating things that happen in an actual laboratory. So that's one of the one of the main things I see that affects the whole deal as far as research and publication coordination seems like a very large problem to me. So even if you attempted synchronous coordination of laboratory groups and or research groups now being in very different time zones and uh, differentials in access to the technology. Again, it's a lot of it relates to this dependence on one mode of accessing both one another and information that there's a really great study that we'll, we'll have on the resources recently by the, I can't remember what it's called, the <laughs> something with government relations about research, but that tries to really describe the effects of the slowing down of the capacity of laboratory research and funding and performance <clears throat> because of all these just ripples of hiatuses um, that have affected major research work. As far as philosophy and honors and multidisciplinary um, humanities kind of work, I see a similar thing in the sense, and this would apply with like, uh, oh, I should add, like the others mentioned about access to persons for, or human subjects, uh, the same is a huge effect in access to any kind of living specimen or uh, even materials, you know, again, for ongoing documenting research in, in the sciences I work with. And then other things about the synchrony and asynchrony and available of, availability of texts that affect a lot of the research and the other aspects I work with include that learning process, one might say in philosophy, for instance, is mostly dialogic so that your group of learning would be working through a thing together at the same time, which can be somewhat mimicked in a virtual situation, but not guaranteed in any way. And, you know, there's benefits and drawbacks to reading a text and then holding on and discussing it at another time. Um, but it's certainly a different form of learning, I guess, is what I would like to point out. I've noticed that very much with my mathematics classes as well, that working through problems in an immediate and uh, embodied scenario versus uh, trying to work it out and then trying to remember where you got stuck <laughs> for, at a later time with a group, um, perhaps with a group. Uh, so a lot of it, yeah, it's around access and the unimodality, I would say, of, of technology versus the multimodality that's greatly affected. And then, again, of course, access to places. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect, depending on the size of the research group, uh, environment in, you know, exploration or, or sampling. Um, but anytime there's a, a, a lab scenario that's been greatly, greatly affected. Thank you, Nathan, and thanks to all the panelists for your perspectives on that.
Um, does anyone else have something to add before we move on? I did remember that I also <laughs> wanted to mention that my subject areas have had a lot of pressure to publish, uh, which Aaron somewhat mentioned with the health sciences and COVID research. Um, but I can't think of a class I haven't been in this the, the last few terms that don't point out that, that we don't have the necessary time for reduplication and verification that we need. So uh, there has been a kind of push towards these preprint or opening up studies and data, but the time needed for that to become, as Aaron mentioned, to the peer review process, uh, that's another big issue in the research and publication area. Yeah, uh, the health sciences has been engaging in that arena, actually, in a big way, long, even long before the pandemic. But um, uh, it, even then, they, they still maintain the peer review process, uh, even when going uh, open access. I can't remember if I mentioned the, the 98 percent statistic or not, uh, but the, that uh, the first JAMA editorial I mentioned uh, notes that um, submissions to JAMA have increased 98 percent. Uh, in 2020 versus 2019. So there are a lot of people writing about it. <laughs> That's particularly interesting, <clears throat> given that most academics, um, at least most institutions I'm familiar with, have extended the tenure timeline for folks by a year, understanding that it's more difficult for faculty to be able to conduct research this year. And yet there is still a lot of pressure because we need the information that results from the research. So a bit of a, of a disjunction there. All right, I would love to hear from you about how access to scholarly materials has changed in your fields. Yes, Ginger, um, I will start with this one. So um, as, as I was mentioning before, um, you know, one, one of the big trends in general um, in libraries is is dig, digitization, digital project, digital collection. So, um, I I wanted to talk about one one major digital project that that's helped us here, um, and and a lot of other universities as well. So there there's a uh, it's a it's a database. It's also um, we might think of it as a collaborative repository. Um, is is called Hothi Trust. So HothiTrust.org, um, and it's it is a extraordinary resource. So, so what it, it's based um, physically at the University of Michigan, but a lot of other universities uh, have participated. Uh, it's, it's just a, a major di digitization project um, and a database that, that we have access to. So one of the big advantages um, of this for, for us is uh, after the pandemic began, uh, they, um, they started a, a special program, uh, which which they they call the emergency temporary access service, um, and and this this has allowed us our library uh, as well as many many other libraries um, to basically give access uh, to these uh, digital books these these ebooks uh, books that have been digitized that are in that database. Um, if they correspond to to physical books that, that the the library actually owns, so so of course the problem was people could not actually enter the library, uh, could not use the library, could not check out the, the physical books, um, but but because of that, um, um, it is possible. It has been possible uh, to to get the the digital version, to get the digitized book, the ebook through this database, HathiTrust.org. So that you know that's been that's been very good. Um, um, there, there are good search features. You can search the the, the book itself. Um, uh, there, there's some concern. I think um, after the, you know, the pandemic ends, uh, we we hope it's going to end. Um, you know, what's going to happen with with these types of endeavors, uh, these databases, and so forth. Um, one, I think this this service is probably going to end uh, just because of copyright restrictions. But that's that's another another issue. I'll add that um, many resources uh, relating to different aspects of the pandemic from commercial publishers have been made available uh, for free. 
uh, this year. And and Ethan's right. There is a a strong likelihood that that access will end when the pandemic clears up or largely clears up. Um, It probably there. There's not going to be some some ringing bell and then it's gone. Everyone, yeah, it'll be a a process of um, it disappearing. So it's kind of unclear when access to material like this would go away. But um, yeah, presumably it will. Uh, I have well, well, it's free though. Uh, I have uh, collocated a bunch of it uh, on uh, this. coronavirus guide uh, that I put together uh, on the library website. I'm going to uh, share the chat real quickly. If I can. Okay, it doesn't want to copy and paste for me. But anyway, um, we, we'll put the, the link up on the um, the uh, library's um, pandemic series, uh, lecture series website uh, after uh, the recording. Uh, so I've collocated a bunch of uh, this material uh, on uh, a site that I've put together on the library's uh, website. Oh, there, there, it's been added to the chat. Okay, great. So I want, I, I, I think that's, that's worth um, highlighting uh, in particular. Thanks, Aaron. I think I would mm-hmm. just add to that, that it's, it is in some ways generous of publishers to expand access to these resources that are very rich and are an enhancement to what we're able to subscribe to. It also has the, um, the, the frightening possibility of getting people hooked on these uh, resources that are a bit beyond our means normally. So we'll, we'll see how uh, pricing of these resources is always a, a huge issue with inflation year to year and limited budgets that stay stagnant. Um, so we will we'll see how long they continue to be generous and what we can do to keep these resources. Looks like Nathan, yeah. Yeah, well, well, that's what I had noted down, particularly that there are many forms of increased open access or these temporary emergency accesses uh, in many platforms, but we already have noticed the temporariness of them as they, especially with proprietary platforms, it'll be shut off in June. Oh, oh, we need it a little longer and open in August. And then who knows when it won't be there. That's one of the problematics. And then uh, variation in resources. One thing I've really noticed is it highlights the problematics of um, not having a blend of resource types, but primarily relying on electronically available types. And I see that in the ways we're able to search for it so that what we've all, at least in the library, been aware of the algorithmic and biases and uh, problematics with database structuring and programming in general of the access to information but you see increasingly when you know that there are these things available, say in your collection or uh, closely related to to watch um, databases and search engines return things where you're very clearly realizing, and for the students I noticed this too, what is being seen and returned and what isn't and how is it you know, uh, determined and ordered on the page and the fluctuation of that between each person's access point. Um, Who's deciding that, you know, a lot of things like that have really been highlighted when we're greatly depending on trying to provide electronic access to things. And then I, the other piece I really wanted to point out was how formats organize information for us and provide context. So I know Ethan must experience this with history and archives. And um, again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about lab work versus virtual lab work. Uh, But that loss of the material context when you're both the demand that you have to have devices to access it and particularly strength of internet connectivity or or access to it, 
Um, and then even just, I think one thing I'm really noticing that it's pointed out <clears throat> information literacy, we call it, but the skills of accessing information um, are super required. Like you can expect all the students to find stuff, but if they haven't really been taught <laughs> how to, uh, all of us actually, uh, to manipulate and work computable systems, uh, it's it's going to be blind to us. It's very different from finding the right book or textbook on the shelf and having those things nearby it be closely related. Uh, and I think something we don't often think about is just the confidence of the searcher. And this goes from the youth all the way up to each of us that when we have to change formats completely and ways of access that uh, that takes quite a bit of courage and I think more than less of us are hesitant believing that we're finding all we could when we work through one one medium. Um, so another thing that kind of comes up in relation to uh, having this reliant, great, much greater reliance on digital formats is um, the digital rights management. So all of these electronic texts that we're talking about, it's, it's not the same as it would be with a print book where I could go and you know make photocopies of it. And so some of these materials, uh, when the library purchases materials, we're very careful to make sure that you can download it and annotate um, at least certain sections um, and make sure that those rights are negotiated so that researchers have the, the ability to do the type of work they need to with those texts. Um, and some of this emergency content doesn't allow you to, to download the content, doesn't allow you to annotate and work with it. Um, and so that is, has been a, another issue, although the access is expanded, there you have more things that we can offer. You don't necessarily have the same ability to manipulate it as you would otherwise. Um, and with the digital archives as well, a lot of times what you'll get is just the scanned text or just the text itself, but not the entire context. So a lot of times, um, you know, for instance, people will be researching um, advertisements in old magazines and our archives, sometimes it'll just have the articles themselves, but it won't have that context of, you know, what else was on the page with it. And so, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful that we're getting this expanded digital access, but then there's also issues of it not always being comparable to the, the way that you would see that material in a physical format. Yes, Megan, and de depending, I did a workshop on uh, historical newspapers. So depending on the age, you know, of, of a newspaper that, that's digitized, the, the original may, may be in a condition that it's, you know, it's hard to um, to really digitize it and, you know, actually convert it into, into uh, the, the type of text that a computer can read um, if, if the original, you know, is not in, in great shape. So, so that's, a, that's a big issue. This issue that Nathan's talking about, just the, the di major differences sometimes between the actual, you know, original item versus uh, the, the digital copy or, you know, whatever happens um, when, when we convert it to digital form. These are some really interesting points and the differences of, of interacting with scholarly materials online versus in person and all the various challenges to access. Is there anything else you guys want to add? Okay, take a sip of water, water break. Your next question that I'm curious about, um, what are some unexpected issues that emerged since the pandemic began? Yeah, so um, I'm happy to start uh, with that question. So I think that um, some issues that have um, become increasingly important um, have to do with privacy and surveillance, um, particularly in relation to education. And, you know, privacy is also extremely important in library science work, um, you know, protecting patron privacy. And it is, of course, important in education as well. Um, and so we're having just sort of a whole slew of issues um, from, you know, sessions being recorded initially in that first beginning, you know, March and April, sometimes people didn't know they were being recorded. Sometimes administrators at schools didn't realize the software they were using was recording classes. Um, 
people didn't realize that private chats from Zoom meetings show up when you download the entire chat transcript, so they're no longer private. Um, you know, there was an extensive amount of targeted harassment of specific groups um, because their meetings, their Zoom meetings are public. So like Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, um, and, and those meetings need to be public to some extent, that is part of their purpose. Um, so there have been just a variety. And then there are really like a myriad of issues with um, test proctoring software, uh, remote test proctoring software. So, you know, one example having to do with surveillance, I think that is particularly concerning is there was a student, um, a 12 year old student in Colorado Springs um, playing with a toy gun in his home and he was in a virtual art class um, and the teacher called the principal and the principal called the police and the police arrived at the home of a 12 year old black child um, to investigate what was a toy gun. Um, they called the police before contacting the child's parents. Um, that student was then suspended for five days. Um, he now has a record with the El Paso County Sheriff's Office and a mark on his school disciplinary paperwork that says he brought a facsimile of a firearm to school. Um, so that's deeply concerning um, in the ways that technology is being used to surveil marginalized groups and the harm that that might do. Um, there was another child who was in the home at the time. That child was also suspended for five days. Um, and another factor is that the school was recording the students in class. That's how the recording could be watched later of what happened. And parents were not, um, the school did not obtain parental permission to record the sessions. And school administrators said they didn't know it was being recorded. That was their response. They didn't understand the technology. <laughs> so um, another you know, major area of concern is test proctoring software. And this has a lot to do with higher education in particular. So um, you know, examples are exam, Examity, um, Honor Lock, Proctorio, Proctor U, Respondus. So um, there are, you know, varieties, but the way that a lot of the software works is it records your computer's camera, it records audio, it mon it records the websites that you visit, it measures your body, it watches you for the duration of the exam, it tracks your movements. Um, to identify what it considers cheating behaviors that includes tracking eye movement. Um, if you do anything that the software deems suspicious, it will alert your professor to review the recording and provide them with a color coded probability of your academic misconduct. Um, so, you know, there is a whole long history of algorithms, um, AI, machine learning, et cetera, um, being biased, racially biased, biased in terms of gender and biased in terms of gender identity. So um, some examples might be, um, you know, when using Proctorio, um, there was a black female student who was routinely prompted to shine more light on her face. Um, but then the software couldn't validate her identity. And this happened so often. The software could not validate her identity and therefore she could not take the exam. She had to work out an alternate solution with the professor because she was unable to take tests because the software could not recognize black skin. Um, and I, I sort of, you know, dread thinking of all the students who are encountering these issues whose professors are maybe not amenable to uh, accommodations or maybe students who don't choose to ask for them. Um, similar issues emerge with students who are trans or non-binary. Um, so sometimes um, there is a person, there's a live person who is doing the proctoring. Sometimes it's automated and sometimes it's a live person. Students are required to show their IDs at the beginning of the exam. Um, many states create barriers for students to change their gender identity on their identification. Um, and so often that ID, the gender on that ID will not align with that person's gender identity and it'll affect their ability to take an exam um, for their class. Uh, this software, many of these software, you know, it involves recording your camera and that means that people who are in the background will also be picked up. 
So if someone lives in a home where they do not have their own room and people are picked up in the background, that will be flagged as suspicious behavior that potentially you could be cheating. Um, additionally, <laughs> Um, eye tracking is concerning for any students who have disabilities. Um, you will also get flagged if you leave the computer, like if you get up to go do something, that will be flagged. Um, any students who have disabilities that require frequent bathroom breaks, that will affect them as well. Um, and, you know, this soft, these recordings, these video recordings exist for, you know, who knows how long. Um, can be downloaded by professors. Um, often the recordings are essentially owned by the company. Um, so students lose that right. Their privacy is, is violated in many cases. Um, sometimes when a live person is proctoring a test, the student is required to give them remote access to their computer. So another person is being given remote access to your computer in order to complete a test. Um, and I mean, I think that the most concerning thing with all of this is that there really isn't any evidence that this test proctoring software effectively prevents cheating. So in the scholarship, you know, we don't see that. We don't necessarily see evidence that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. So, so it is ultimately, you know, creating a lot of issues and barriers for students and, and it's not necessarily addressing the issue of cheating. Um, there are, you know, lots and lots of workarounds um, for all of these test proctoring softwares that are available on Reddit or other sort of informal forums where students share their strategies um, for, I mean, essentially cheating or, or, or figuring out a way to work around the limitations. Um, and these companies have made, you know, millions of dollars in the last few months um, off of all of this. So I, I do find myself wondering quite a bit what harm is being done um, by all of this. Um, and it's it's something, you know, whether people are conscious of the issues a lot like associated with any software that violates people's privacy, or whether they're just simply not aware. They don't know that they're being recorded or they don't know that students' IP addresses are being recorded when they take an exam. Um, it's concerning either way. I'd like to in general that again it's not that any of that hasn't been happening for ever since this all began with internet communication technologies but i do believe it's been highlighted i've read about instances of you know if you have students in well because everything we do in the databases or these online conferencing uh platforms captures such rich data, right? You usually have image, you have IP address, um, you have just all, all sorts of things, a lot of times voice recognition and so forth. Um, in some of those more uh, governmentally policed countries, uh, they're blocking access to students, right? If they hook up to a to a class that's uh, in the US or whatever, as well as, you know, there's no way for us, again, as librarians and committed to privacy um, to guarantee confidentiality when you sign on to EBSCO or ProQuest or any other form, like they're pulling whatever data they choose to pull. Um, so yeah, and, and with the class thing for academic freedom too, like, you know, anybody taking part in your synchronous class can be clipping recording cuts and taking words out of context and you don't know where it's reused and we don't have any control over that as faculty. Um, Okay, I'm looking for unmuted mics and seeing none. I think we can move forward and, oh, Nathan's got his hand up again. Yes, Nathan, what else? Is Sorry, I, have, I thought oh. someone else would talk about it, but um, <laughs> um, the, the one other thing that I've really noticed in particularly teaching and learning and with some faculty, well, like from, from David's department is 
the the pressure to choose available digital electronic content over the best content that you would prefer for your course. So there's, uh, for instance, that somebody in the biology department really wanted to use the a, a classic text, which we own and is on the shelves of the library, but copyright won't allow any student to copy as much as they need for the class. And certainly not all the students in the class. And so, you know, we had to look for an alternate form that was less than the best quality wise and content wise um, that would satisfy. So it's like a forced, that's a probably a library information term, but um, sort of a pushing to be satisfied with what you find or is available rather than what is best. And I, I, I fear that a lot with this, this uh, transfer over to, again, a uni mode or a singular context that things that, and I, I'm sure this affects the humanities a lot too, where there's a book you really want them to have, but you can't provide everyone access to digital copies because of copyright, even if it's sitting on the shelves of the library. Um, and because you can't get a whole group of students together looking at it um, close enough, then that those that was an unex I think a little unexpected to me that that would really be so prominently highlighted the pressure to elect materials that were electronically available, even if the materials you wanted or the best materials in this case were owned by your own library, but also um, but also just in general. That really highlights the um, value of uh, digitizing uh, material, you know, in archival format back uh, as, as many years as you can go and as many years as it exists, uh, which some companies, some publishers have done, uh, the JSTOR database in particular, but many have not. Uh, so material that is older than a certain age is often just not available uh, digitally. Uh, and that can be valuable information depending on the context of who is learning what and what you're trying to do. Uh, but uh, further uh, highlights and reinforces uh, the increasing value, the, the continuously increasing value of open access information and stores of open access uh, content uh, because it effectively allows uh, people to uh, not have to tangle with copyright questions, which you're right, are unclear. They're, they're intentionally unclear uh, in copyright law uh, so they can be interpreted in different ways as needed. Uh, but that leaves people with a lot of questions and open access uh, resolves those questions uh, and has continued to uh, become an accepted form of scholarly communication. Uh, that was true before the pandemic, but it's uh, the pandemic is throwing it, uh, an even brighter spotlight on it now. Yes, with the, the issue of copyright, there's also... Um, I think some of my colleagues here know probably know more about this story of the Internet Archive and all their their legal battles. But I mean, they're, they're in the humanities or, or I guess in the creative fields, there's also this issue of, you know, how how can people actually do their work and, and be compensated for it? So so, you know, if if people, you know, scan scan a book, you know, let's say I publish a book and then someone just copies that and puts it up on the Internet so anyone can access it, then there's no way for me you know to actually be paid for for you know for all this creative work that i've done so so there's that there's that issue as well just to add a little bit to um to nathan's thought about satisficing i think we all have so much going on so much change in our lives and just our day-to-day -day practice practices of how we're working and how we're interacting with the world, that there's also a sense of urgency to find whatever satisfies as quickly as 
possible. So that leads you towards the most immediate and readily available solution as well. You have enough, enough other things to work out that at least that needs to be dealt with. I'm sure that was an issue in course textbook selection, um, you know, among other things. Um, Lisa, I see your question and I'm gonna let the panelists answer one more and then we'll address that at the end if you have time to stick around. Um, the final question that we do have is what positive things, nice to talk about during a pandemic, um, what positive things in library service or digital access might continue after the pandemic? Well, I feel like I've been talking a lot, um, but one of the things I've really noticed uh, in the sciences, maybe particularly, but I also I found really rich sources in the humanities, um, is this, it, it goes to what Aaron was speaking about, importance of scholarly communication at an open level. Our, rich, rich resources of shared open data and resources and bibliographies with links and everything. Um, it it, it kind of relates to the emergency context. So National Institutes of Health, UNESCO, World Health Organ Organization, et cetera, have all opened up like ongoing research and access and made very usable um, listings of these things for anybody to be accessing. Most of that is very specifically COVID related so that we can internationally um, work on and fight that. But there are also Google Docs and other forms of sharing that are faculties and researchers from all departments forming these like philosophy bibliographies and uh, humanities and political science. I was just finding so much today. I thought I had a pretty good list, but <laughs> it's really, really booming. And that I find wonderful, like even just for uh, as, as a instructor or faculty member, like options I wouldn't have thought about to use in teaching that I'm exposed to that are from all over the world um, and could be very closely related to the subjects or topics that I work on, but I wouldn't have noticed them unless I was reading these open bibliographies and, and shared, shared uh, lists. So I think that that's a big piece that kind of goes with the uh, emergency libraries from Hathi and Internet Archive and JSTOR, et cetera. But crossing our fingers would be available uh, freely in the into the future for, for scholars to share. Nathan, it may shock you to learn that at one point in time, those resources were not as rich as they are now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, obviously there was a time before the internet when they just didn't exist, period, and this wasn't a question that could be even conceived of. But, you know, the internet has come along, and um, yeah, now, now they, they do exist, and they've gotten richer and richer as years have gone by. Uh, I would hope, this is far from guaranteed, but I would hope that um, especially with the uh, the brighter spotlight that's being shown on them through uh, pandemic era research now, I would hope they they would gain a further acceptance uh, in uh, the academic community, but also the just the the general public uh, is as well. Uh, in, in the academic world, they started out with a, um, a, a kind of a question mark hanging over their heads as to is, the, is, is this even formally published? You know, is putting content on the web and making it available for free, does that constitute publication? Uh, and the, that is technically still an open question, uh, but I think the pendulum has been swinging more in the direction of answering it in the affirmative. Yes, it does constitute publication. More and more people are doing it now, including prominent names, prominent voices who have valuable content to uh, 
to contribute. It's even given rise to uh, people who can get their voices heard across you know, multiple online platforms uh, who would not have otherwise been heard before. I mean, there, there is such a thing as a, 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 a an open access scholar. So somebody who would not have been published otherwise, who might have a valuable contribution to make to a field uh, and can do so through open access work. Uh, so that uh, the uh, changing the attitude uh, towards open access, viewing it in a, a more positive light, a more accepted light uh, for aspects of uh, valuable research uh, is one possible outcome of uh, pandemic era research, but it'll just it'll, the progression of time more generally and the, the enriching, the, the uh, enrichment of uh, open access content as it just grows and grows and grows as more and more of it's produced. Uh, that's far from guaranteed. But uh, that could be one uh, possible uh, valuable outcome. Yeah, and um, to kind of build on what Nathan was saying, um, in education, um, and by that I mean, you know, a anyone who teaches, <laughs> um, there has been really an immense amount of sharing of teaching materials um, that has emerged. Um, and it, you know, like Nathan, at first I tried to keep track of all of the Google Docs and Google spreadsheets, these collaborative documents that people were adding to, um, and it just became impossible because there were so many. And particularly, um, you know, faculty in higher education who have experience teaching online were really generous in sharing so many of their materials and their experiences and their advice um, that to take, to take all the time to do that um, is really impressive. I have compiled just some of these resources, which are free and open um, on this guide. Um, it's our faculty guide, and this particular page is, um, has to do with online teaching resources. So there's quite a few, some from the sciences as well. Um, but, you know, these are, they're open access, but they're not open access publications, um, which, you know, Aaron was kind of talking about. This is just people sharing syllabi and class activities and all sorts of other things that I think will be really valuable. They're valuable now, but they're going to continue to be valuable um, in the future, regardless of, of whether um, we're able to return back to normal of education and you know, the majority of people having face-to-face -face instruction. Yes, an another issue um, that we've talked about is um, just the, just the issue of conferences. So, so in in the moment we're in now, um, you know, obviously a lot of conferences, um, pretty much all are going to be available online. So, um, you know, that that is really good. I mean, it, it means that people don't have to to spend you know a lot of money to travel uh, to to a place to attend the conference, um, which is which is a good thing. So, I think cer certain trends like this. I think I think probably we may be realizing that you know certain aspects of our work certain aspects of our um you know general expectations for you know particular areas of, of work like librarianship where you know you may be expected to to attend 10 conferences they may change once that we're we're realizing that we can do a lot of it um you know it's going to be different it's obviously a different experience uh, going to a webinar um online versus you know an in-person conference but but at the same time um you know, the, the present environment has, has opened up a lot of opportunities uh, for learning. Absolutely, um, as Ethan was saying. And, you know, some conferences have been experimenting with different formats, um, you know, spreading the conference out over a period of two or three weeks so that there aren't conflicting sessions happening at the same time um, because there isn't that, that time limit situation. Um, so it's been really interesting to see some of the innovation going on in that area. Just 
to bring it back to the uh, ACRL framework for information literacy, what Aaron was talking about earlier reminds me of there's a, a frame or a lens, as, however you want to think of it, called authority is constructed and contextual. And in this case, when when peer reviewed research is not yet available and scholars are posting on their own websites or discussing in online forums and things like that, that may be the best information you have access to. So it may not normally be a medium you would be citing, but as publication is progressing and as research is underway, that might be, you know, that's where the scholarly communication is actually happening. And so you, you take what information you can get from the most authoritative source you can find. I think that may be particularly valuable to uh, you know, physicians and nurses and frontline workers trying to learn as much as they can about different aspects of this virus quickly as quickly as possible uh and yeah yeah I, there is a a question mark hanging over non-peer-reviewed information but if it's you know submitted to a through a peer review process and a, a researcher just makes it available in advance of the the that process playing out because it will be of value to frontline healthcare workers you know that is um uh, <clears throat> Uh, 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 I, I would say a, a pretty unique situation in this case, but a, um, a, a possible situation where non-peer-reviewed preprints uh, are going to be of value just to just get the information out as fast as possible because the healthcare community needs it now. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, and actually I got some interesting data on um, that from a, a webinar last week, but it, it was saying that in the SARS outbreak in 2003, 93% of the research on that outbreak came out after the pandemic was already over. And now at this point, we already have, I think by certain estimates, you know, close to 100,000 of these preprint articles and they're slowly going through the peer reviewed process. Um, peer review on average takes about hundred days longer than it does to get it to these servers um, that are pre-peer reviewed. And so, um, you know, this is kind of unprecedented. And even in um, the Ebola outbreak and the most recent Ebola outbreak and the Zika virus outbreak, um, only 5% of the studies about those were published before they were peer reviewed. And so this um, coronavirus is really, really kind of unprecedented. Um, just push to get everything online as quickly as possible and then sort of work out the details, you know, as quickly as possible afterward. And so this is a really unique moment that we're in here. It really shows the uh, extended development of the internet as a communication medium. So, and how ubiquitous it continues to become uh, in how we as human beings communicate to each other. Yeah. The other thing that I th think is positive is, uh, and it's kind of enabled both because places were closed or at least close to their normal patrons and users, uh, is the increased and expedited digitization. Like Hathi is an e example, but even just individual libraries while they were closed could really devote more of their resources and persons to digitizing archives and uh, other materials that could be, you know? And so I think we, a, a surprising positive is that more and more um, was made available at a quicker pace than could be if everything was running normally. And the last little piece I, I wanted to mention in positives was, uh, in some ways, I believe the push to virtual interactions and engagements has, at least for me, increased uh, this awareness of the availability of librarians to students and faculty and classes and learning management systems. When it's the only way we can go about working together, it seems like that awareness has um, increased and that's something I certainly hope continues after the pandemic is the awareness of the flexibility of collaboration whether you're a remote student or a, a on-campus student um, and that that you can get help without necessarily needing to 
find a time or space or travel <laughs> to get to us or the library that that we can be interacting and, and really across faculty that collaboration since we've had more meetings i think a lot of people have gotten more comfortable with um, we can reach out to each other this way and work together going along with that nathan uh taking the university libraries here as an example we have known that we had a a growing population of distance students that we didn't have a robust way to interact with um, yet. And we had many of many of you on the screen had goals to find more ways to interact with distance students this year. And then we realized everyone became a distance student and we all of our workshops are now online. And so we've been we've been forced into meeting a need that already existed. And so I think we're gonna be able to find a way to continue those sorts of things, online workshops, Zoom reference as needed and when it's appropriate in the future when maybe we would, we might not have felt ready for that um, beforehand, but I think there's a bit of grace with folks that we are all realizing that nothing we do online is going to be perfect and we don't have to put out a finished product like a, a Hollywood film um, that we're, you know, we're educators and colleagues first, and we need to just be disseminating the information and collaborating as best we can. All right, that's been a robust, more than an hour of really fascinating to me discussion. So um, panelists, yeah, I think you can all take a nice deep breath. Um, it was a really riveting conversation. We have had some questions going back and forth in the chat box at this time. Um, I would invite any of you who have further questions, either unmute and ask them or post something in the chat box. We'd be happy to, to have a dialogue now. Yeah, so I wanted, I saw there was a question about the census from Lisa, so I wanted to take that one. Uh, but I also wanted to mention for anyone who is watching the recording and doesn't have the chat, um, we have been posting links, but there will be um, all of the resources that we've mentioned. We will have a, like a bibliography on um, on the website for this event. So if you're looking for that. Um, but the question from Lisa was about um, the Census Bureau's American Community Survey and um, worried that they might not be as accurate and complete this year for um, economics research. And so I did want to um, just quickly um, make the distinction between that American community survey and the decennial census. So the research I was talking about is about that 10 year, every 10 year census that is just 10 questions. Um, and what I've seen the preliminary data um, is that it is pretty comparable to um, the completeness it has had in past years, which is the same that in lower income and language um, areas, non-English speaking areas that it's, it's really not that great, but it isn't that much worse this year. Um, but regarding the American Community Survey, that's a much longer um, questionnaire. And that's actually distributed continuously to 3%, I believe, of the US population is always receiving that. And so um, I, I haven't heard anything in particular about how the pandemic has impacted that, but my guess is that it would be less of an influence because it is a much smaller body of people in an ongoing way. So I think that they are able to track that probably as in a little less of a marathon than this uh, summer decennial census push. Megan, it looks like Nathan's asking if the, if that's carried out via mail, are you talking about which form of the, the census or the American Community Survey, Nathan? The ongoing community survey, yeah. I, I was thinking. Yeah, that actually, I came to my house once. So I do, I was a part of that 3% one. So I can say um, they, they did send me this, this really large uh, booklet and I didn't fill it out quickly enough. And so people started coming to my house and leaving me flyers. Um, so yes, it starts out as, um, as something that they mail to your house, but they will very much follow up with you in person if, if they don't hear from you. Are there any other questions?
we have a note of appreciation in the chat that I'd like to read for uh, anyone listening to the recording. As an older returning to school, I can't even begin to tell you how much I have appreciated the WSU library staff. You are rock star. Thank you very much for that. I think they are too. All right, with no further questions, I think we should talk about some upcoming sessions we have for this series. Yes, thank you, Ginger. So let me um, go ahead and share my screen again. I do have a final slide for us. If I can figure out what I'm doing. Yes, uh, so this is our, our next event. I mentioned at the beginning that this is the first in a three-part series. And the second two events, we will be joined by departmental faculty to continue these discussions of sort of the, the background of research, what's going on behind the scenes from um, both librarian and departmental faculty perspectives. And our next event is October 14th, um, again, from three to 4.30, like this event. And it's a it will be called Public Health Information and Misinformation in the Wake of COVID-19. Uh, so despite the, the limits of the scientific community's knowledge on COVID-19 um, and what they've been able to gather so far, there have been countless news reports about the virus, TV, radio, um, other formats reporting on what's going on and either unintentionally or sometimes intentionally, uh, much of this content can be misleading to the public. So, um, so this panel seeks to demystify the virus and it will address what is known about it versus what is speculative or just plain unknown. And it will also address techniques for how, how people can separate fact from misleading information regarding the virus. So um, Aaron Bowen, our health sciences librarian who has been on this talk will be the moderator for that discussion. And he'll be joined with Jeff Jarman from the Elliott School of Communication along with Sonia Armbruster and Amy Chesser from uh, the Public Health Department. So that will be a very exciting conversation and I'm certainly planning to attend that one as well. So we hope to see everyone um, at that event.